China was in the grip of a revolution, and the mandate of heaven was slipping away from the emperor. Foreign influences had infiltrated too deeply and disturbed the social harmony. Within a few decades, upstarts would overthrow the reigning son of heaven, take power, and impose a whole new economic system. Capitalist industries would be replaced by a government monopoly, with all production owned, directed, run, and distributed by an all-powerful central government. Sound familiar? If so, you're probably thinking of the later version. Two and a half thousand years before that, revolution also loomed, but it was a bit harder to see. During the 6th century BC, the Zhao dynasty seemed secure and prosperous, ruling over an empire that covered a large swath in the mid-latitudes of what is now China. Much of their power was based on bronze. Possession of nine three-legged ceremonial cauldrons made of bronze symbolized the dynasty's right to rule, and a tightly controlled supply of bronze weapons enforced it. In Zhao China, bronze could be used for almost no other purpose besides imperial ceremony, religious ritual, and officially approved armaments. In most places on Earth, that prohibition would have been difficult to enforce due to the geological commonness of copper deposits and the resulting wide distribution of mining and smelting. But geology had given the Zhao some help in controlling the bronze supply. In China, unlike most other places, most production came from a single gigantic ore deposit at Tonglushan, where geological processes had created a mining jackpot. Massive amounts of copper ore had concentrated at the contact between two different types of rock, where the material was friable enough to mine easily with hand tools, and formed minerals like malachite and azurite, remarkably easy to smelt. It was far easier to get copper out of Tonglushan than almost anywhere else. Mining had started there by the 9th century BC, and over the course of the ancient period, an estimated 40 to 100,000 tons of copper were produced from seven open pits, 252 shafts, and 50 smelting sites with up to 10 furnaces apiece. The copper was smelted, alloyed with tin, and cast into bronze ritual cauldrons, swords, spears, and crossbow bolts to be bought by the upper classes or issued to the emperor's army. Most warriors had to make do with plain old bronze, but from at least the 800s BC, the Chinese upper classes distinguished themselves and their incomes by having their bronze armaments inlaid with pieces of iron forged from fallen meteorites. The naturally high nickel content of meteorites prevented these inserts from corroding, and the silvery color of the iron against the golden bronze made the weapons aesthetically pleasing as well as lethal. But only the extremely wealthy could afford a chunk of heaven-sent iron. The slightly less extremely wealthy had to make do with iron accents from sources closer to Earth. Sometime around the 8th century BC, the Chinese began smelting iron from ore minerals. Most archaeological evidence indicates that iron smelting had begun among the Scythian peoples of the Central Asian steppes around 1000 BC, and had diffused thence to Xinjiang, where the Chinese picked it up via trade and cultural exchange. From there, iron smelting spread eastward through Zhao China and around its periphery. But whereas iron forged from meteorites was a precious and incorruptible metal, iron smelted on Earth was anything but. Without the high nickel content, it corroded easily and lost most of its aesthetic and practical value. Most aristocrats or would-be aristocrats of Zhao China would hardly disgrace their ancestors by fighting with such ugly weaponry. But not everybody was so picky. The state of Wu lay in the Yangtze Delta southeast of the Zhao domains and was populated by Austronesian speakers whom the Chinese considered more than slightly barbarous. Their social system was comparatively egalitarian without much state control, particularly over mining and bronze making. Instead of coming from one giant government-run mine, copper was dug from a few small deposits dispersed through the land and smelted into bronze at numerous small furnaces. According to a somewhat later text, Every Man in Wu was his own bronze maker, 
This exaggerated, but the bronze industry was far less centralized than in Zhao, China, and smelting know-how was much more widely diffused. There was also a much larger and more complicated range of ores to deal with, since not everything came from a single highly pure copper deposit. And crucially, the main use of bronze in Wu was in hoes, plowshares, and other agricultural tools. Weapons and ceremonial items were a minority of the uses. So when iron smelting arrived by about the 6th century BC, it found a ready market for a metal that, while mechanically inferior to bronze, was far cheaper. Farmers in Wu began to switch from bronze to iron tools, which smelters now began to produce in abundance. At first, iron smelting was all of the bloomery type, meaning the furnace could not get hot enough to melt the iron ore, but reduced it to a large ball of solid metallic iron and slag without melting. The iron workers would cool the furnace, extract this so-called bloom, and then laboriously hammer it on a hot forge for several hours to free the bits of iron from the slag and join them together into the required object. In China, that was as far as it went. But in Wu, with less state control over the metal industry, a big market for metal farm tools, and a history of working with ores that were tougher to smelt, the metal workers quite possibly also had more incentive to think. Sometime that same century, a few of them apparently decided they'd had enough of hammering iron out of a bloom, and opted instead to stick it into a furnace used for casting bronze. What happened next must have been a surprise. The iron absorbed carbon from the charcoal fueling the furnace and started to melt. Carbon lowers the melting point of iron to under 1200 degrees Celsius, easily attainable by the Wu bronze making furnaces. Instead of a solid lump that had to be pulled out and hammered, liquid iron poured out of the smelter, ready to be cast into a variety of shapes. The metallurgists of Wu had invented a material new to East Asia, cast iron. Cast iron naturally solidifies with a carbon content of 4.3%. At first, it isn't very useful, because this carbon takes the form of iron carbides, which are extremely hard, but also very brittle. But about the 4th century BC, the metallurgists of Wu discovered that they could cure this problem by heat treating the cast iron at a bit under 1000 degrees Celsius for a few days. This wasn't hot enough to melt anything, but would cause the iron carbide to dissociate into iron plus a bunch of tiny carbon spherulites. The result, which Western metallurgists would later call malleable cast iron, wasn't anywhere near as hard as the untreated stuff, but it was a lot less brittle. That made it good enough for everyday uses. And another innovation, the blast furnace, made it possible to cast iron in large quantities by continuous smelting. At appropriate intervals, the workers would break holes in the side of the furnace at the right level to pour out molten iron or slag, just like tapping a maple tree, while another worker added more charcoal, iron ore, and flux into the top of the furnace. Being continuously drained and recharged, the furnace could run 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And once blast furnace smelting had gotten started, it couldn't stop. Unlike other types of smelter, a blast furnace cannot run efficiently unless it is large, retaining heat better, and going at full capacity without cooling down or needing to be reheated. The average or garden variety operation in ancient Wu could easily smelt and cast half a ton of iron each day. So iron smelting and iron working proliferated, and hoes, plowshares, and other tools made of malleable cast iron became ever more plentiful. Soon, their use began to spread north and west into China itself, along with the use of blast furnaces. From the 3rd century BC onward, nearly all tools in China were cast iron. After that, it wasn't long before enterprising metallurgists made two key discoveries. One was that forging and quenching cast iron, with a few elaborations, could make a pretty good steel. In fact, it made a steel that was better for bladed weapons than bronze. 
over the course of the 4th century BC, military uses of steel began to spread. By the end of the next century, bronze remained the favored metal for ceremonial purposes, but all functional swords and other weapons were being made from forged iron and steel. And the second key discovery? That would be the capitalist possibilities of the iron-making process. The usual blast furnace was limited not by iron ore, but by charcoal supply. It took a couple square kilometers of forest to provide enough charcoal for an iron-making center. So most iron smelting took place at small settlements located in remote forested areas well away from cities and towns. In these places, the tycoons of the iron industry would settle hundreds of workers in a self-sufficient community whose sole business was to produce iron. These had varying degrees of encouragement from the states arising from the fragmenting Zhao domains. The biggest supporters were the Lords of Qin, which late in the 300s BC was a rising state in the interior of China. There, iron and steel barons became fabulously wealthy as they supplied the Qin armies with vast stocks of iron weaponry, and in return, the state pursued policies that concentrated the iron industries and the profits in their hands. In the late 3rd century BC, this military-industrial complex enabled the Qin to wipe out the remains of the Zhao dynasty and put a new emperor on the throne. But public discontent with the iron industry had been growing. The iron-making settlements, staffed as they were by hundreds of bored single young men in remote areas, tended to double as bases for debilitating banditry. Iron works charged exorbitant rates for the iron tools that by now everyone needed. Resentment of the iron industry's de facto oligarchs grew with their wealth. Then, in 209 BC, the second and last Qin emperor died, and a new dynasty, the Han, took power. For a few decades, the Han tried various gradual reforms of the iron industry, ranging from further free market experimentation to centralizing ironworks under close government supervision. But over time, the emperors began to discover more and more advantages to state control over the iron supply. In 117 BC, the Han government expropriated the entire iron industry, castigating those shiftless persons who get their sustenance without working and become wealthy, profiting by the labor of the common people. Instead, the government would take total control of iron mining, smelting, casting, sales, and prices in the name of the people. Private enterprise in iron was forbidden. Violators would be put in shackles and have their equipment confiscated. In a single year, 500 people were sentenced to death for unauthorized private trade in iron. According to the government, these strict measures were necessary to prevent oppression, to ensure high-quality products, to provide weapons for national security, and to safeguard public harmony. And so began a new iron industry with Chinese characteristics for a new era.